let's start out with your mother. You told me recently during a coaching session, I take bridge instruction. I've done some, played some online with you where you're, where you're teaching me bridge. And during that conversation, you said that, that you started playing bridge because of your mother. That is true. Uh, my mom is of a generation where in college, almost everybody uh, knew a little bit of bridge, it seems. And to hear her tell it, uh, you'd walk into the student center and there would be multiple games of bridge uh, going on at any given time. And she had played a little bit at that point, probably didn't learn in a sort of disciplined way like we all did and probably didn't always learn kind of the right way to play bridge because she was getting taught by her friends who probably just got taught by some other students. But they were just kind of having fun with the game and it was part of the culture, it seems. So everybody just felt like it was a, a normal thing to be doing in their spare time. And so she had played and enjoyed it in college and then had a kitchen table game when I was a small child. And at some point when I was a bored teenager over uh, a summer, she said, hey, you know, you, you like all these other games. You really should check out this, this bridge game. Why don't you go get a book out of the library? And so I went to the library and at this point we were in the Poconos. So I went to the local library, uh, which did have a bridge book. It was Charles Gorin's Big Book of Bridge, the 1953 edition. And that's how I learned to play bridge. Four card majors. I learned some newfangled 1953 conventions like negative doubles. Um, <laughs> and I was kind of off to the races. And it impresses me that you remember specifically that it was uh, the 1953 edition. Well, I think I think that fact... It was not lost on me at the time that that was strange. So uh, I think that's why it stuck with me. So you were 13 and this was the summer before eighth grade or? I was 15, I believe. Although interestingly, I have uh, less of a coherent grasp on, on the year it actually was than, than the year of publication of, of the book. Uh, I think... <laughs> It was the summer of 1991, but I, I wouldn't swear to that. And so there's something to elaborate on that. You, uh, this is in the Poconos. And you said that soon after getting the book, you went to the local bridge club and played. And then the next time you went to the local bridge club, club and played, the club had one life master and they arranged for that life master to play with you. Yes. And I think having a young player at that time in that game was so novel that everybody just really enjoyed kind of having me around, which I know has not been the universal um, reception for young players in this game. I think uh, it varies so much based on the bridge community um, one kind of encounters whether they're um, extra welcoming or maybe um, kind of resenting an outsider, perhaps a brash outsider, in my case particularly. And uh, that can really shape a whole life of bridge because I'm sure that if I had gotten kind of a cold shoulder or even worse, a sort of nasty greeting, that, that just would have been the end of it. I was just a shy teenager, so uh, that, that probably would have finished me off. But the... <laughs> Uh, the converse happened. I was treated so warmly that I uh, really fell in love with the game and pursued it. So how long into this Gorin book did you end up going to the bridge club? And like, what was that? What was that process like? That I have to say, um, I, I'm pretty sure I got all the way through it before I went to the club. And I was a very, <laughs> very shy teenager, painfully shy, which might surprise those who know me now, or, or maybe not. I still have some introverted tendencies. And so it was my mother who actually arranged the game for me. She called and said, hey, I've got this son who's kind of interested. Can you find him a partner? 
And you know, she drove me there because I did not know how to drive. And so um, really all the, the credit for, for my, my bridge career uh, is with her in my mind. So like when you say you didn't know how to drive, were you old enough to have a driver's license or? So I was 15. Um, and I think I might in theory have been old enough to have a learner's permit in New York. I, I don't know what the rules were in Pennsylvania, but uh, I've always been uh, scared of driving. <laughs> I actually got my driver's license in 2001. So I was 26. I was uh, living for a year in California. So I needed to be able to drive to get myself around. And uh, I got back to New York in 2002. And I have not uh, driven a car ever since. Uh, I'm I am a menace to all on the road. It sounds like a classic New York City kid to be like when I was 15 years old, like I was chomp. I mean, granted, I lived on a farm in Virginia, but I was chomping at the bit to get to get the to get behind the wheel. <laughs> yeah, you know, my peripheral vision has never been that great. Mm. Um, the rear view mirror was always kind of optional for me. So oh, uh, wow. it's probably a little better that I'm I'm retired. <laughs> So you were at this time, you were going to the oldest school in the United States, collegiate school. Were you a, a survivor, as they call them? Ah, wow. You really have done your, uh, your research. I was not a survivor, which, is, which are those who uh, spent their entire pre-college years uh, at collegiate. Uh, I transferred there in the third grade and then uh, through, uh, through my senior year of high school. So did you come, when you came back to school, was there any sort of bridge activity at collegiate or did you end up going to honors or something like that? Like what was the, the next step? Yeah. So I actually did kind of rustle up sort of a, a kitchen table game, if you will, at collegiate. We didn't really know what we were doing and the idea of bidding for more than nine tricks on any hand was just completely <laughs> incomprehensible to us. The idea that somebody could take more than nine tricks on a hand was pretty much a stretch. So I did have that as part of my, my early experience, but fairly quickly, and again, with my mother's uh, prodding and uh, you know phoning ahead and all that, I ended up at the Manhattan Bridge Club, which was uh, at the time in a basement um, on West 73rd Street, I believe. Uh, we shared uh, the space with some Hungarian gamblers. Yeah. I'm not still sure to this day exactly what card game they were playing, <laughs> but I got very lucky there uh, <laughs> because at the time there was a really vibrant junior bridge community in New York City and it was centered at the Manhattan Bridge Club. And so at that time there were players like Blair Seidler, Lap Chan, who was not quite a junior, but was also um, one of the young hot shots, uh, Randy Lazarus, and some others. Um, you, you might know some of those names, John, uh, who were kind of really hot shot young players and were hanging around just playing a lot of bridge. I'm not totally sure if anyone had jobs during those days. All, all those folks ended up eventually being respectable people, real jobs, quote unquote, but they were certainly playing a lot of bridge in those days. <laughs> And they were really generous with their time and their advice. They would go over hands with me. They'd play with me sometimes. Uh, and so that was, again, just really important. I had a group of folks that I could kind of relate to. I was 16 probably at this point, but still, mm. even though these, these guys were you know, five, 10 years older, um, still, um, that's very different for a 16-year-old than kind of interacting with a senior citizen. So it was accessible for me and uh, really, really educational. Going back to this first game in the Poconos, like, were you already, like, did you already, you were, you, you described yourself as being kind of a, a little, I don't know that obnoxious is the word you use, but that you were sort of sure of yourself at bridge. Like, were you, do you remember that being the case in that first? Uh... Well, I think most teenage uh, kids, certainly boys, posture a lot. Mm. Uh, so I don't recall, I think actually one strength that I have in, in bridge is my ability to 
not just have an opinion, but also to kind of handicap for my certainty about that opinion. So some stuff I'm, I'm pretty confident I know. And so um, I don't revisit it too often, but then there are other things I'm less sure of. And I kind of spend my time and energy um, re-examining those. So, so I don't feel like at bridge in general, I'm overconfident. Um, I'm certainly confident, yeah. but probably uh, somewhat realistic. And I think at that time it was probably the same, but of course, a 16 year old kid, you're not going to show any weakness <laughs> to the outside world. So that was never really an issue in the Poconos game because there were no alphas there. Everybody was just really nice and really laid back. And so that was actually a really nurturing environment. There was no need, you know, to assert myself um, and, you know, as an individual, as, as teenagers might, might often have to do. And has the, the, the guy from the Poconos, the life master you play with, like, is he abreast of your bridge career? Like, to this day? Yeah, you know, that's actually sort of a sad thing, which is I just completely lost track of him over the years. And I've tried to find him on the internet. Uh, I, I put quite a lot of time into that with with no success. Wow. So that that is a little sad. I, I would have liked to hunt him down and kind of go over, go over some hands <laughs> like in the old days. Well, maybe somebody from this podcast will uh, will be able to help you in that uh, in that regard. That's a good point. So his name was Stephen J. Dunko, and he lived in Hemlock Farms, Pennsylvania. And this is uh, this would have been uh, in the early '90s. So did you play with Stephen more than once? Yeah, you know, he actually started running his own game in a nearby town at. He would drive me to that game. Um, so this is some later summers. I don't remember exactly the timeline. So he would drive me to that game. Sometimes I would play there with him, sometimes uh, with a customer who you know, he just needed a partner for. So I was just kind of the utility guy. And it was great because uh, it was about a half an hour trip back to my place and he would drive me back and we would talk about the hands. <laughs> And I can't tell you how many times we would drive half an hour and then sit another half an hour in the driveway, still talking about the hands. So uh, those were good times. Do you think like at that time, like reminiscing about going over the hands, do you think you had already, were you already better than him? No, no, definitely not. He was a reasonable player. It's hard for me looking back to know exactly how reasonable, but I was still starting out and he could run squeezes mm. and end plays and things like that. He wasn't too sophisticated in the bidding because he just wasn't kind of part of the modern tournament scene. And of course, yeah. bidding itself was much less sophisticated everywhere in the early 90s. Wow, man. That's great. <laughs> uh, when did you... When you said customer, like I thought maybe you were playing pro, but I, I I quickly realized that that wasn't the case. Like when did you when did becoming a professional bridge player? When did that become a an option, and how did and how did that happen? What's the, the there's a Hemingway quote um, from from the Sun Also Rises, I think, where one of the characters is asked, uh, "How did you go bankrupt?" And the answer was gradually at first, then suddenly, <laughs> and so. I think I would give you uh, the same answer. So <laughs> the gradual part is that uh, in some of the, the college summers, when I was already at that point a pretty reasonable player, I would fill in in a rubber bridge club. So I was a house player. So basically, if there were three people who needed a fourth for a game, I would just kind of jump in and play for my own account. And I would also occasionally be called on to sort of uh, help with instruction, kind of as an assist assistant in some of the lessons that they used to give at that club. And so that was kind of my first foray into kind of collecting money around the game of bridge, but obviously wasn't a traditional um, sort of playing professional relationship. That uh, happened to me in 2001. Uh, I had just done a three-year stint on the floor of the American Stock Exchange, trading stock options, 
things were uh, not good for me in the dot-com bust era. So I uh, left the floor and uh, really didn't have any plan for what the next step was going to be. And right around that time, completely serendipitously, I think, um, I was contacted by uh, a player who actually wanted help winning some of the local regional events that New York had at that time. New York used to run these reasonably prestigious multi-day knockout and pair games. Back in the 90s, um, folks like Paul Soloway and Grant Bays would fly in with their sponsors to play in these events. And they were just large events with very strong fields. And so I was hired to help this player win the Goldman pairs, um, which is the two-day pair game, which he had never won. And that ended up kind of blossoming into reasonably long-term uh, professional situation for me. So you did actually win the Goldman pairs with him? Did we win the gold? I'd have to, I, I don't actually think we did, but we were, we, we decided to play the 2002, I think, Cavendish pairs. And I think we were leading after three sessions of that. And so um, this was uh, my partner's name, Glenn Milgram, who's actually a really excellent player in his own right. And, you know, hopefully I had some contribution to that, but um, he's also an extremely uh, knowledgeable and talented player, very tough opponent. Um, and so we ended up kind of not really worrying about the Goldman's and trying to win national events instead. We came seventh in that Cavendish pairs, and we had um, a number of top tens together in national pair games, including two seconds and a heartbreaking loss of the blue ribbon pairs on literally the last hand of the event. But they were they were good times with a lot of good bridge. Um, and Glenn is just a fantastic human being, in addition to being an excellent bridge player. Um, so those times were, were really great for me. It was a great kind of introduction to professional bridge. Tell me about the, uh, the blue, about lo losing the blue ribbons on the last board. Yeah, this was fairly brutal roller coaster of an event. So on day one, I had food poisoning and was not playing particularly well. And we ended up in a tie break for the last qualifying spot. Uh, we had exactly the same number of match points as someone else, and it, it, the tie had to get broken by board a match, um, which the computers couldn't do at that time, so the directors had to kind of break out the scores by hand and, and board a match us um, against one another or ho however it was. So we got in at last qualifier on the first day. We had two consecutive 65% games the second day to be in third place um, going into the finals. We had a third 65% game uh, in the first final session. So we were now ahead of second place by two full boards and three full boards plus ahead of everyone else. The second place pair was Bramley and Lazard, uh, who we, as the movement fate would have it, we were, we were fated to play in the last round. So uh, we're playing along in the evening and I think we're doing pretty well. I, wow. I feel like when we sit down at that table, we're, we're well over 60% with that lead. And so I'm kind of, I, I'm feeling pretty good about it. But then, you know, Bramley asks me, how are you doing? Just like that. And I said, uh-oh. You know, that's somebody who thinks they have a chance from two boards behind. Um, so we had, it was a two board round and we had two, two bad results. The first result, the Bramley and Lazard opened Flannery with an unsound hand, just looking for the swing, they explained afterwards, and reached four hearts from kind of the concealed side of the table. And basically we had to make a, a almost impossible defense where um, at trick two, with dummy having, uh, they, they reached four spades. I guess I went two diamonds past four spades. And Glenn had to, uh, he, he led his ace king. And then um, seeing the dummy after the opening lead, he had to switch to 
Jack Doubleton of Hearts with Ace, 10, 9, 5th in the dummy, um, just to kind of get a trick for my king. Um, whereas, you know, he knew nothing about Declarer's Hearts. I, Declarer could have had King Empty Third of Hearts and it could be blowing up a trick. It was just, it was just an impossible play to find. So we got a stone zero because it was not normal for them to be in game. And certainly anybody else who was in game from the other side of the table, which I think was more normal, it was going to start, you know, one heart, two clubs, two spades, you know, something like that. Anybody who was playing from the other side of the table would have been defeated easily because the switch was much more obvious seeing the the, the dummy at the, at the other table. So we took a stone zero on the first hand. Mm. And then on the second hand, we had an opportunity. So we were now actually behind and we had an opportunity to win on the last hand by bidding a really thin slam, which I think if we had been on the same wavelength about our auction, we might've kind of steamed into and, and uh, we would have made it but sort of an obscure auction for our system came up and we hadn't discussed all of the inferences. And so we had a slight disagreement about whether uh, four of our minor was forcing. And so we played, you know, four clubs instead of five clubs, which would have made us second or six clubs, which would have made us first. And so we, we finished fourth. So that's my, my hard luck uh, blue ribbon pair story. But, you know, look, the opponents <laughs> came back and had... 66% or something like that. I think we ended up with about 54 or something like that um, after those two horrible scores. And, uh, you know, them's the breaks. Normally, I would have thought um, being in third place going into the final day and averaging 60% would have been enough to win. But this was just not one of those days. The hands were exciting. So there were a lot of big games. <laughs> wow. Hmm. Yeah, so that was uh, that was kind of exciting and we we did have some other poor glenn he, he's he's still never won a nationals we, we had another second place where we were announced as the winners by under one match point and then there was some appeal that didn't involve either us or the second place pair but it kind of changed the match point between the two pairs so we lost by you know 0.03 or something like that the next day so wow. um that was I'm sure very sad for him to kind of, you know, leave the playing area thinking you've won and then, uh, you know, find out the next day that there's been some some sort of minor ruling. Um, I was emailing with another, uh, he might have been your next professional partner, I'm not sure, but I was emailing with Roy Welland recently to ask him about, I, I saw that he and Sabina play optional exclusion and I thought that sounded like a really good treatment. And so I, I asked him, about like what they play and he emailed me back and one of the things he said was that in a relay auction with the help of the opponents that he asked you for key cards optional to get to answer optional exclusion three times before letting you play in three spades making 140. <laughs> yes that was uh that was a really incredible that wasn't an exclusion one. we play all, uh, Roy and I Roy was the first kind of serious national sponsor um, to put me on his team. That was in 2007. Um, our first tournament was the Nashville, uh, the Summer Nationals in 2007, the beginning of that cycle, where we were second in the Grand National teams and uh, got to the semifinals of the Spin Gold. Good debut tournament there. Roy is an amazing player, uh, really, really talented. And... He uh, has a lot of very interesting ideas about bidding. And um, so these optional asks come from his system. And so the idea, Roy's general idea about slam bidding is that if we can find out the shape of one of the hands and then kind of just each hand says how good it is in context, cubids are not that important. It doesn't matter the exact control. Sometimes it'll be a hand like that where... You know, you need the ace of a certain suit because you need to kind of win the ace on the opening lead and then pitch all your losers. Those two kind of hands do come up, but they're pretty rare. And so Roy believes, or at least believed when we were playing, that it was a mistake to worry about those kinds of hands. And so the system was designed with a lot of bids that said, okay, I've heard your shape. Here's what's trumps. Tell me how much you like your hand. And if you like it, 
also tell me your key cards along the way. And so uh, these methods only came up in nominally game forcing auctions, notionally game forcing. But uh, the hand in question, Roy had asked, the opponents had doubled, I had shown a minimum. Then I believe because the auction was so low, he was able to re-ask again. And I, I don't remember the details of it, but he had, the, the gist of it was that he had a devalued holding based on the double. You know, he had something like, you know, king third in the suit that had been doubled. And maybe I had even shown a singleton there. I don't remember, but it was some situation where he kind of, he was pretty sure that his hand was no longer really a game force based on the combination of me showing my shape and the double. And uh, so when I had shown a minimum, minimum, uh, it just happened that that step that I showed the second minimum with was our Trump suit. So he was able to pass. And Roy, I mean, he actually, he's, some players kind of care only about results and Roy is super competitive, but he also loves um, beautiful things about the game. Yeah. Um, so I think that's one of the reasons the deal excited him so much, right? It's just <laughs> something where you launch into this game forcing relay, you're thinking maybe there's going to be a slam and then things come up just so and you end up playing in three spades. Uh, and that is actually an incredible thing about bridge is just you, you never know where any hand is going to take you. What was the the event Imps, match points, what? It, it was imps. Roy and I almost never played match points. And when we did, we we did horribly because our style <laughs> was ultra aggressive. Ultra, ultra aggressive. Yeah. Um, and so uh, that's a, quite a reasonable imp style. Less good in match points. Match points is much more of a conservative game, um, at least strong match points. And so this must have been imps. I don't particularly think it was one of the really major events. I think it's just, it's such a remarkable occurrence that that could ever happen in bridge. And that's why it kind of stuck in both of our minds. I, I was pretty sure what hand you were going to talk about when, when just when you started to mention Roy and him recounting a hand to you. By the way, David Laurie is the new headmaster at Collegiate. I think he's coming in this year. He was the, previously, he was the headmaster of my elementary school alma mater, St. Anne's Belfield. Oh, I, I guess it, the private school world is sort of a small world. It's not surprising in in retrospect. So in uh, in some of the some of the research that that Michael did back in 2012, you said your best result was was getting to the semifinals of the Rosenblum with uh, with Michael Rosenberg. Yes, I was very proud of that result. Michael and my um, second tournament together. So I guess there's some theme here, which is maybe all my partnerships. So, uh, you know, we start out, you know, with our, our best results. That's pro probably not so good, um, not so good a theme. Um, maybe, maybe some reason for that is that when you're starting out, everyone kind of tries to build a fence around partner. You both kind of know that you're not on firm ground and you make um, allowances. And then maybe, maybe later it's easy to sort of not accident proof everything so much. So maybe it's, it's easier to start having some more silly results. But uh, that was a great tournament because Jeff Wolfson had kind of decided um, pretty much at the last minute to um, return to competitive bridge for this world championship. And now um, everybody I'm sure who's listening knows Jeff as a fixture in the high level events. Um, he had also been a fixture in the mid 90s to the early aughts, but he'd taken quite a number of years off of the serious bridge, I would say. And so he had a first time partnership for that event with Larry Cohen. Um, he asked Michael and I to play, and we were joined by uh, Ron Pachman and Eldad Guinnessar, who were at that time a kind of hotshot young pair who had relatively recently won the European Open teams. And we started out pretty rocky with, with after two, of, two days of the three-day round robin, we were fairly long shot to qualify. I think out of the 75 victory points that were available, we needed wow. about 60 of them, give or take, um, looked like going into the final day. We ended up getting 72 of them uh, and qualifying easily. And we had a rather difficult run, I would say. In the round of 32, we played the South African team that had been in the finals of the most recent Olympiad. 
Um, so we won that match. And in the round of 16, we played Kane, which was Kane and Michael Seaman and Belitsky, Zmazinski and Laria and Versace. We thought at the time it was a hard team. Now uh, I realize not only was it a hard team, but we were probably being cheated as well. Um, but we did manage to ride a huge third quarter to victory in that match. In the quarterfinals, we played Fleischer, which was Fleischer and Camel, uh, Martell and Stansby, and Levin and Weinstein. And we beat them in a match that was kind of close the whole way. Uh, I still do remember fun hands from that one. Uh, and then we played Nickel in the semifinals, where we had a very wild uh, set of boards in the fourth quarter. And unfortunately, we lost by four. We just uh, you know, needed the, the clock to expire a little earlier or a little later, maybe, since uh, that quarter, the lead ping-ponged around um, quite a bit. And so I'm very proud of that result because we really beat a lot of truly excellent teams and gave um, Nickel, which is obviously the best team of the modern era, a good run for its money. And I just think even most teams that win a big knockout probably don't have that many big victories on average. Um, usually, if you're going to get deep into one of these events, <laughs> the secret to it is having somebody good lose before they get to you. Just otherwise, the uh, statistics catch up with you, right? How many, how, many, how many tough matches in a row do you rate to win? Not going to be too many. So I certainly was, was and still am extremely proud of that result. Uh, we lost the bronze medal playoff against Fantoni and Nunes. So again, you know, this, this tournament definitely has a uh, tarnish over it in this way, in my mind. But, you know, that doesn't really take anything away from the you know, all of the good, tough matches that we played against honest teams. Like Michael Rosenberg is, is you know, he is, he's in the pantheon. How did, uh, how did the two of you come to play? You know, Michael and I go way back. Um, we were friends on the floor of the American Stock Exchange when we both traded stock options there in the late 90s. And we used to spend a lot of time talking about bridge <laughs> because I think one thing that anybody who knows both of us knows is that we can kind of, you know, talk until everyone else is bored and you know, we'll, we'll just keep going together. So we knew a lot about how the other person thought about Bridge. I certainly respected Michael's game. Um, certainly at that time, he was established and I was not. But uh, I guess he had sort of come to um, respect my game. So Andrew uh, had Michael on his team and needed a partner for him. And so uh, I had been friendly with Andrew since the mid-90s. He's also a, uh, a collegiate man. And uh, it, we... We always had a really nice relationship. He, he's just a great guy. And um, that's what he thought made sense for the team. And so Michael kind of agreed to try it out. And, you know, we had a spin gold and then we had that, that rose and bloom and, you know, we were doing well. So we, we stuck with it for, for five years. Um, who was a better trader, you or Michael? <laughs> um, it's very hard to know. Um, he wasn't trading the same products I was trading, but uh, I, I, I suspect he was probably the better trader, if I had to guess. So would you say, like, still to this day, does that, uh, is that uh, rank up there, like, uh, as your best result? Or would it be the spin gold, losing in the finals of the spin gold in 2018? Like, It's tough to say. I, I guess I think that in, if, you, if you measure kind of bridge accomplishments by kind of who you beat. That Rosenblum is still kind of the most good teams I've, I've beaten in, in, in one place. That run to the finals of the spin gold was great, but uh, we did have the traditional luck that uh, one has when one does get to the final, which is um, a lot of the seeded teams kind of lost before we had to play them. So uh, obviously we, we beat who was in front of us. That was good. Uh, it's all you can do, really. It, you know, it'd be hard to say. I, I also, I think I might put, you know, finishing fourth um, in the world pairs with David Berkowitz um, in 2016 
16, yeah, 16. 14. And, uh, 14, 2014, that's right. Um, when we kind of filled out a card for half an hour over dinner um, and just and just played. You know, basically we had the front of the convention card filled out and that, that's all we knew. Um, and we just kind of took a lot of tricks. You know, that that's a, that's a tournament where I, I would have liked to meddle. And, uh, you know, I have concerns, to put it mildly, about um, one of the pairs that finished ahead of us uh, who <laughs> shall remain nameless, but... Um, you know, are widely suspected, I would say. Um, and so I sort of, in my mind, I feel, I feel like we had a bronze medal there. What would it have meant, like, if you won the spin gold in, in, in 2018? Yeah, you know, that's, it's a big knock on my bridge career. I've never won a so-called major, you know, Bermuda Ball, you know, world championship, you know, major team world championship, spin gold, Vanderbilt, Risinger. I've had uh, a lot of close calls. You know, I, I probably have the, the most close calls. Again, a dubious record um, of anybody who's not won. So it would have been nice to get that monkey off my back. Um, not to be, you know, you know, that guy is, you know, one of the best players who's never won. I just, I don't like the, the qualifier. So I suppose in that sense, it would have been important. And of course, winning a spin gold is pretty much as good as it gets. It's probably harder than winning a Bermuda ball. You know, um, you can't always control the outcome yourself. There's opponents and teammates and luck. And so I've tried as best I can to derive my satisfaction from my own play and the play of my partnership and to have that be as independent of the result as I can without losing competitive edge. Uh, and I think I've done an okay job of that balance. So that was a disappointing loss. We were very close going into the fourth quarter. It was definitely an easily winnable match had our team played well. But life goes on and my life is excellent. I have, you know, a great wife and just a great group of friends and most of them come from Bridge. It's just an amazing community. So, you know, I just try to be very positive about all the ways that I'm lucky. And then it's, it's kind of easy to forget a bad Bridge result. It's, it's really uh, a small thing in the scheme of things. Would winning the Blue Ribbons have qualified for like a major in your mind? Mm, that's, I mean, winning the Blue Ribbons is nice, but it's not, it's not a major. It, winning a three-day pair game requires beating up on weaker players than you. Whereas winning a major knockout or winning the Risinger uh, requires beating up on players that are roughly equal to you. So that, that's just, a, it's, a different, it's a different type of, of skill and it's a skill that fewer people have. There, there are lots of folks where if the hands come up that way, um, they can win a three-day pair game. And, you know, I think if you look at the results of three-day pair games throughout um, their history, you'll see a bunch of winners that are very famous and a bunch of winners who kind of have never come anywhere close again. Whereas if you look at spin gold winners, it's a pretty select club. It tends to be the same small groups of folks over and over again. Um, there are some exceptions, but many fewer. Well, that's an honest, I mean, I appreciate your, I appreciate your honesty and your candor in, in answering the, those questions. What, like, was there a point in your bridge playing career when you were like, I can be one of the best in the world at this? Like, what, what was the, what was the point when you, when you decided that, man, I'm, I'm like, I'm exceptionally good at bridge. Those are my words, you know, they, they might not, not be yours, but uh, those are my words for sure. Here's how I would phrase it, right? At some point, a player can have a realization that they can compete against the best, right? Um, it's hard to know what, what is a great player, but any player that can kind of compete against the best and really give them a run for their money, you know, that's, that's a strong player. And my first realization of that came in 1997 in the spin gold. So I just graduated school, you know, May or June, whenever it was, then, you know, off to the summer nationals, very exciting. I had a spin gold team, which was, you know, 
good, solid, um, you know, sort of regional experts from New York and New England. We reached the quarterfinals, um, having upset some pretty good teams, and we played nickel there. And after three quarters of the nickel match, we were down either two or three imps. I don't remember what it was, right? So very, very exciting situation, obviously. I remember being really nervous. And, you know, our team actually played okay in the fourth quarter, but got sort of outplayed and out Um, So we ended up losing by, you know, something in the 30 range, I think. You know, if you can get down to one quarter of bridge, 16 boards against um, a team that's won the previous three spin goals, right? No question. This is the best team in the world. You say, well, you know, those 16 boards could have gone the other way. And so if we can beat this team on the right day, then anything is possible. Were you four-handed, five-handed, six-handed? Six-handed. I was actually uh, playing um, for the U.S. juniors at the time. And so while I was playing in the spin gold, I was also playing with my junior team in the morning knockouts. And so I would wake up at 8 a.m. or whatever it was to play the morning knockouts. Um, I had the first quarter sit out every day so I could, uh, you know, finish finish the morning knockouts up at kind of 1130 and then eat lunch and take a nap um, so I could be ready to play in the spin gold and then not fall asleep at the table. I remember that pretty well. That, that's, that's the kind of thing you can easily do when you're 21 years old. Who was your, who was your junior partner? So I played with... Eric Greco, a couple of years in the juniors. I have never entered a junior trials because uh, those days the ACBL used to run the junior trials opposite major events. And in fact, I think that the trials for um, that particular junior team had been run opposite the 1996 spin goal, if if I'm not mistaken. And so Eric and I had not played in the trials, but we were added to that team. And um, that was a real pleasure for me because he was certainly one of the strongest players that I had ever played with, you know, in those days. Um, and, and still, uh, but you know, certainly at that time, it was, um, I, I have played with quite a few Hall of Famers in the meantime, but it was really um, sort of an exceptional experience to play with him then. Yeah, Jeff Jeff Hampson said when I interviewed him that he's not even sure he's the best player in his partnership. <laughs> Jeff. Yeah. Yeah, Eric, um, I mean, of course, I'm sure he and I both, you know, know a little bit more about the game today than we did, you know, t- you know 20 plus years ago. Um, so we're probably both better players than we were then. But, you know, we played pretty well in those days. And what we lacked in sophistication, we made up for with naked aggression, which in a junior event you can get away with. Uh, so we actually played quite well. We reached the finals of the uh, world championships one year and lost to the Italians. And that was really fun. Um, it never came up for me to uh, play with Eric again, maybe maybe someday. Well, are any of the Italians that you lost to, like are any of them? They, they weren't, they, none of them are what you would think of as the, the famous Italians. Um, they're, yeah. they're kind of, you know, good local Italian players. So they've won some Italian national championships and so forth, but none of the, you know, Lavazza teams or Angelini teams or anything like that. Um, it wasn't that level. Of, uh, none of them quite quite made that cut. Um, actually, one of them is a fairly prominent WBF director, Bernardo Biondo. So that's a name that um, folks who go to the European championships, the world championships will probably know. He's probably the best known person mm, on that team. Yeah, I don't, I, don't, uh, I don't recognize him by name. So going back to your, to your mother, does your mother still play bridge? To this day? Yeah, no, my mom, the, the instant I kind of really got into the bridge community, she got out. I, I dragged her back for um, a duplicate or two in the early days, but she said I made her nervous, which I'm sure I did. And <laughs> now she says, you know, I don't want to be like the other Wilenkin in the bridge world. And I, I can kind of understand that. If you're kind of a casual player, it's easy to be kind of subject to scrutiny if you're related to kind of a well-known player right tell me about being on the debate team at williams the team of the year in, uh, <laughs> in 1997 oh god you're really you're digging up old, like, ancient history now yeah so um when i was in college there wasn't really bridge at williams i, I played a decent bit of okay bridge um which was 
the computer bridge back in those days, the only thing, but I actually chose Williams in not insubstantial part because there was no bridge community. I, I feared failing to graduate if there was a, you know, a constantly running bridge game in the student center. So I needed to find um, some other kind of game to play for fun <laughs> and parliamentary debate was it. The way parliamentary debate works is the sort of so-called government side or what um, other forms of debate might call the affirmative proposes a case. And in parliamentary debate, it can be essentially any case. The only requirements are that all of the facts to be used in the debate be part of general knowledge. The so-called opposition side um, is responsible for kind of refuting that, has to stand up after the government is done presenting without any prep time, without any prior notice of the topic to be debated and kind of go for it. So um, it rewarded clear thinking, fast thinking, general knowledge and rhetoric skills. I was, Williams had a very small team, but I was lucky that my class had an, uh, another really um, strong debater, Amanda Amert, my partner in those days. She's now a uh, super fancy uh, lawyer at Wilkie Farr. Not much of a surprise to me at all. And Amanda and I kind of took our knocks, learning from square one because there were no older people on the debate team. Um, we just sort of started it in our year or restarted it. I guess there had been a historical team. And uh, our senior year, we were uh, so sort of the top ranked team in, in the country. And that ranking, is be, being, becoming the so-called team of the year, is determined kind of in a <laughs> similar way to the way that the top seed in the U.S. bridge trials is determined. So the major events all pay some number of points for first and second and so on down. And so the top five so-called markers, the top five scores for each team kind of count. And Amanda and I, one thing I'm proud of about that achievement is that the, the tournament season is about 20 weeks long. Uh, but Amanda and I just went to the first five tournaments. We had five pretty good markers. And we said, you know what? We're going to be team of the year now. Um, at that time, we actually, after the first five tournaments, we had the highest score that anyone had ever had at the end of a season. So we said, you know, we're, we're basically a lock to win now. And so we're not going to debate together at any of the other sort of season tournaments. We're going to go with novices and, uh, you know, younger players. And so we, we spent the bulk of our senior year kind of trying to make sure that, um, the tradition of debate lived on uh, at Williams after after we uh, graduated. Wow, that's awesome, man. We uh, we had a temporary win, um, so the team did run on for maybe another you know, four or five years. But I think after that, it kind of faded out again. It's one of the you know one of the issues with having a team for an esoteric activity at a small college, right? Like graduating class was around five hundred folks. So if you get a year where people aren't interested in it, you it, sometimes it can be difficult to recover. Does your mom like like to take pride in in like your success in, in Bridge? Like, does she does she like to take credit for that? Uh, no, no, she wouldn't take credit for it. And I sort of suspect. I mean, she wouldn't tell me this, but I suspect she'd probably rather um, that I had some sort of uh, real job that she understood. I think she resigned herself to Bridge at this point. But, you know, probably would have been happier if I'd been a doctor or something. Does she live in New York City? Yes. So your regular partner, your regular expert partner for like Nash for big events is uh, Jan Jansma. Yes. What's it like? What's, uh, I think Jan has got, I mean, I've played against him in mostly in pair games, but he, he's got, he's, I th I think he's a pretty, like he's got a, he likes to laugh. I've been to dinner with you guys. What's it like playing with Jan? Well, uh, he's a little bit more intense kind of in real life than you might think if you just met him at the table because he definitely can laugh at the table, but um, he's also a very kind of focused, intense player, 
although he doesn't necessarily show that side as much to the opponents. So he's a, a really tough competitor and a really excellent uh, card player. He's very tricky, so he's often trying to paint um, a wrong picture of the hand for the opponents. So that can be very tough to play against. What about to partner? Is it tough to partner with uh, with those types of deception going on? Yeah, it can be, but there's there's kind of an art to figuring out um, when partner might not care or when partner already knows what's going on. And it does take a little bit of what I think of as a rubber bridge mentality, uh, meaning uh, when I was playing rubber bridge as a young guy, the first lesson I learned was assume whatever you need to beat the hand from partner and assume that partner also knows that and is not going to necessarily signal you that that's the case. So defend on that basis and signal around the other stuff, which might or might not be necessary. So sometimes, um, for example, I know that you, my partner, must hold the ace of spades for us to have any chance to beat the contract. Let's say it's three no trump and I can count nine top tricks for declarer if you have it. So I may hope that you're going to false card in uh, spades to deceive declarer. Or alternatively, if it's a situation where I need to guess what to do, I might think that if you did encourage, you had ace king or ace queen or you know, something in addition to show me. So um, there's that kind of extra level of inference that's kind of baked into the signal. And of course, both partners are not always on the same wavelength, but I think we're pretty good at that. We have a high batting average. That just strikes me as like a next level type of play that your partner knows that you know that he has to have the ace of spades for us to have a chance. And so like, I mean, that's, it's exciting to hear about it. Like it's exciting to think that that type of play is going on because I, it's not something that, I don't think, I don't know that I've ever, I don't know, I I don't, I don't think I've ever been in a situation like that deeply into a hand doing that. So that's, that's why you get, that's why people are hiring the two of you to play in big events. You know, it's, it's interesting that you say that the first part of it, because when I was coming up and again, playing a little bit of rubber bridge, that was considered kind of an advanced but not expert rubber bridge play concept. And I think what has happened is that we all play so much duplicate, right? There's very little rubber bridge now, mostly duplicate. And most duplicate is match point pairs. And so obviously this approach can cause issues in a match point pairs. You might need to kind of more subtly signal because the goal is not necessarily to beat the contract, just to get as many yeah. tricks as we can. So this whole idea of, oh, I'm going to assume a partner has X doesn't really work yeah. that well. And so I think most players kind of start playing in some local match point event. And then even if they graduate to playing team events or even the major team events, they still kind of have that match point orientation to their carding. And of course, the rubber bridge players are giving up a lot of over tricks here and there, <laughs> taking these sort of last ditch efforts to beat contracts. But uh, I, I do think a lot of it is just kind of, it's really hard to have two completely different gears for match points and imps for a partnership. Obviously, uh, there do need to be some differences. There's going to be some different agreements, maybe even for a well honed world class partnership at the different forms of scoring, but uh, it's really hard to change your whole mentality. So I think in practice, there's kind of more match points in our imps than there should be. Can you think of an example of a hand where Jan was able to be deceptive? We, we actually won a really close quarterfinal a few years back uh, where the upshot of it was that he 
he kind of needed the, it, he had entry problems, but it wasn't obvious. And he needed to kind of, so he basically, he needed to try to get a rough in a, in the dummy. And, and so he kind of, he, he basically, it, it, it's really a complicated position, but he led like low from two little towards queen and one, which now kind of caused the opponents to play a trump from something, which allowed him to get to the dummy. It was like, like some sort of crazy hand. I didn't even have to dig it up. Um, it was like really a, you know, potential, you know, brilliancy prize hand, um, just where if you mm. looked at it, you know, for, for me now, maybe I have that club in my bag because I've seen it, but it's the kind of hand where you could have imagined a really world-class technical card player staring at it for five minutes and not finding the solution because it's not a technical play. Mm. It's just realizing what the deal looks like to your opponents at the same time as you're right. kind of, you know, playing it yourself and trying to think about what the actual right. deal is. Right. Um, and, I, right. and I do think both of us have a bit of that. I, I'm pretty likely to spurn um, the best technical play in exchange for kind of information concealing plays, mm. you know, so to pass up, oh, you know, you can, you know, you can play for, you know, three, three and the thing on side, or you can uh, hope they don't find the switch and uh, kind of try to set up a trick in another suit. And so just mm. obviously each situation is context specific, but I just say in general, I don't mind somebody saying after the hand to me, your play was 0% and you could have done this other thing. If by 0% they mean I needed a missed defense. Because uh, in, in real life, you do often get missed defenses. And also, there's if you are known to be a tricky declarer, you may pick up points on a normal hand where you're just doing something normal because the opponents are worried that you've taken a non-technical play. So um, I'm comfortable mm. with that. How much is the quality of opponent or opponent specifically does it go into? Like, uh... Yeah, it's a really interesting question. And I think kind of it, it gets back to a more general question, which is how do you best outsmart some particular set of opponents? Because when we sit down at the table, obviously we're kind of trying to do well on our own decisions, but also we're trying to anticipate the opponent's thinking and kind of be uh, one step ahead of them. But I think the key there is being exactly one step ahead of them. So in other words, uh, you, to take a simple example, um, a dramatic false card isn't going to do you any good against an opponent who's not kind of looking at what you play and then maybe you threw away mm. something useful or misled partner or, yeah. or something. So it's definitely true that the opponent's level um, matters a lot, but there might be some plays that you would try only against strong opponents because you have the way I always like to think about it is having kind of control of the table. What I mean by that is you're pretty confident that if you play a certain move, the opponents are going to reliably play a move in response. So you can kind of mm. have the thing play out as you want. Mm. And in certain ways that can be easier against really excellent opponents because mm. they're, going to be reasoning in a straightforward way. And so you can kind of, it's easier to sort of predict how they'll react to certain bids and plays, uh, certain information they perceive. Whereas playing against weaker players, we might be able to get away with some additional deceptions. But we also are likely to prevail if we just play straightforwardly and, you know, don't mess up and don't miss any technical chances. So um, I would say it's not that there are more or fewer opportunities, depending on the level of the opponent, just different opportunities. Like, can you think of a time when your like opponent, like that was really, you did great, you did really well there? Um, or is that something that's at the table during a, during an, a big match? In my experience, when people get, swindled they <laughs> almost never make that kind of comment whereas uh they may well make it for um a great kind of technical play <laughs> and, and and that's not just for kind of the obvious reason that maybe they're feeling a little stupid and so um they're right. not gonna say anything but also because 
they kind of know they messed up, but um, a really strong player who knows they've messed up is not going to be spending a lot of mental energy thinking about you know, mm-hmm. why they messed up. They won't necessarily know at that moment, have recall of exactly what their thought process was. And so they're probably just on to the next hand most of the time. And that's obviously a critical, critical skill in bridge. If you dump some imps, um, well, hopefully the opponents will dump some imps on the next hand and you'll be back to even and go from there. Do you have any sort of cue phrase for yourself or something you say to yourself when you have a bad result? Yeah, you know, it's interesting. I, I don't tend to be bothered by individual bad results. I think I'm pretty good at not letting that affect my bridge game. If there are a few results in a row, I'm definitely not an A plus in this category and I can do some steaming. But uh, I I rarely get upset about one hand unless there's something other than the poor result that is making me upset. But uh, I just, there's going to be so many imps exchanged in uh, any day-long match, for instance, right? That one 12 imp swing more or less is, I mean, significant, of course, but it's unlikely to be, um, it's much more likely to be match deciding if the player who loses from it is affected by it, right? Because then it can turn into maybe another eight imps of soft tilt, right? Where I'm not, going crazy and psyching, trying to get my points back, but I'm just kind of making inferior decisions because there's a little piece of my consciousness that's still um, thinking about the previous board. Usually by the end of a set, um, I don't have a good short-term memory of what the hands were. So my partner will sometimes say, oh, did you like my four spade bid on board five. And I'll say, well, what, what was someone's hand, right? If I, if somebody, if they tell me what someone held on the deal, I'll remember it right away. Mm. But, but I'm kind of not, it's not sitting there. The hand record's not sitting in the you know front of my consciousness. Is there something when you're starting a partnership, like, is there something that like would be like a no go, like something that, like if they want to do the, if they want to play this, like that, I don't want to play with them. System wise, no, I've always played my partner's system. That's just always been my way. So when I started playing with Michael Rosen, when I played with Roy, I played his relay notes and I just learned them and we tweaked them together um, over the years, I think made them a little stronger. Um, But we started with 100% of his notes. Um, When I played with Michael Rosenberg, he sent me his set of notes with his previous partner. It was about you know, 135 single space pages or something like that. Um, but I diligently learned it for that first tournament. Um, and I think by the time we got done, it was um, around 400 or so. My, Michael and I, we, we were scientific in those days. Um, we had a lot of agreements. Wow. And uh, with Jan, um, it's actually been a little closer to a blend. So he really likes Polish club. And so doesn't really care that much about other stuff. And so I said, okay, well, how about we do it this way? I'll play your Polish club stuff. So like your, your minors and you can play my majors. And so um, that sounded good to him. So that's, that's what we do. So this is actually the, the most input I've ever had, but I'm really happy as long as it's sensible. I'm really happy just to play whatever makes my partner comfortable. Did Roy design his system on his own or did he get it from somebody? Like, So we were playing, I guess, um, what what is now become uh, known as transfer Walsh with a sort of a relay overlay on top of it. Um, so the transfer Walsh ideas were originally Scandinavian, um, I think Swedish, but wouldn't swear to it. I certainly I started playing them. I was actually playing those methods. I think before Roy got around to it, um, I played uh, with a. Um, a New York partner of mine who had played a little with Bjorn Felenius. And so I think the transfer Walsh kind of drifted through in that way. Um, But the relays, um, I think that was Roy and Bjorn um, designing it themselves, but I I don't, I don't know for sure. I haven't seen it anywhere else. So um, that's my best guess. One question I have, I don't know about your, your father. Like we haven't talked about your father. Is he, is he alive? Yeah, so my dad died of kind of a freak infection in 2016, where he was pretty 
pretty healthy guy who kind of ran all the time. And, you know, he was really looked out for himself. So that was kind of one of those, I mean, obviously it's super sad to lose your father. And, you know, in particular, it's sad when somebody sort of really spends a lot of time kind of preserving their low longevity. Um, but basically he just got some, some really like rapid infection and they didn't figure out what it was in time. Um, so, uh, he was a great guy, very, he was a, he was an attorney by trade, not naturally, um, and a litigator, but, but not naturally argumentative. Um, he just, that was just his business. He was actually always very supportive of, um, whatever I did as an adult. Uh, oh, you want to, you want to, you know, go trade on the floor at, right out of college instead of taking our, an office job. Great. No problem. Oh, you want to play bridge professionally? No problem. He just, my dad went with the flow. And your brother, uh, your brother has played some bridge? So I have a younger brother, Tim. He's five years younger. Um, he knows the rules of bridge. I've been trying to kind of get him to take it up as a uh, hobby, but he's very social. So um, I think he, he hasn't found the time or inclination yet. And like, do you have any projects like bridge related projects or like, uh, like what's, what's on your horizon? How are you dealing with the, the coronavirus? Yeah. So the last few months have been interesting. There has been a massive increase in demand for online playing and online teaching. So I would say at the moment, I'm mostly um, reacting to that demand, um, trying to kind of get everything scheduled in a sensible way. Um, I think I'm now in the intermediate term at roughly 50 hours of lessons a week or something like that. So um, it's really, you know, there's not a lot of time for um, side projects, considering that I'm also the food shopper and chef in my family. Uh, and uh, given um, the quarantine, uh, I probably uh, cook about 10 meals a week, probably order in the other four, something like that. 10, 11, I cook. Um, so between kind of, you know, sort of taking care of the food situation and playing bridge and, um, you know, finding time to have a nice glass of wine mm. occasionally. Um, I wouldn't say that there's a ton of time left for other stuff. Uh, I have been, to the extent that I'm thinking about anything in a grand way, it's, it's how to optimize the new formats that are available for online teaching. Um, so Zoom, uh, for example, um, and additional functionalities of BridgeBase. Uh, the idea is um, figuring out how to cram as much learning as possible into a short period without detracting from the fun part of Bridge. Right? Because, it, you know, first of all, many of the folks that I, um, I teach, they're not serious tournament players. Um, so part of the goal for them is, is really to have fun in the lessons. Um, you know, for more serious students, maybe the lessons are kind of a means to the end of um, kind of competing uh, more successfully. But a lot of folks don't have those kinds of ambitions, so I need to make it fun. And I also know that it takes a lot of learning um, to become good at bridge. I mean, I'm still learning every time I sit down at the table. Um, so my students really have a lot to learn. And so if I can make it fun for them and they won't burn out, um, they'll get to where they want to go um, a, lot, a lot more easily. I've definitely, um, definitely been doing a lot of tweaking, trying different things. Uh, I have a bunch of different kind of speeds now, if you will, um, depending on what I think um, might be appropriate for the individual student. Um, but I do think that the, the sort of, I do not have any students who are just hiring me to kind of do well in, in the local duplicate. Um, everybody has um, some interest in learning. And so there is an art to helping them as well as I can. So that, that's, that's what I'm working on. As, as a student of yours, like, what would you say in order for me to improve in bridge, 
what do I need to do? Well, you have a lot of talent. So I think um, for you, it, um, it, improvement rates to be kind of faster and easier than, than for many others. But I do think the main, what, what I would tell you, and I, I think I've told you this uh, before also in private, is if you really want to have success at the highest levels of the game, right? And you, you've had a lot of success, right? So now we're talking about rarefied air already. But if you want to have success at the highest levels of the game, even if bridge is not your job, you have to treat it like a job. So you have to kind of work on it, you know, regularly, many days a week, whether you happen to be interested in doing it that day or not. You have to study the parts of the game that are less fun to you, not just the parts that are more interesting. And yeah, and just treat it as if um, it were your livelihood because right now the highest levels of the game are dominated by professionals. So if we act like those professionals, we have a good chance and, and assuming that uh, we start with some reasonable degree of talent, which you certainly have, there's a really good chance of, uh, you know, as, as I was talking about earlier, right, being able to hang in there with the best. Who's better at Barbu, you or Dana? <laughs> hey, you'd have to ask Dana. <laughs> you to take a comment on that one. Uh, you're, I, I see you guys are on a team with Mig for the uh, upcoming Barbu World Championship. Yes, Migri and Dana and I are all kind of, and, and Migri's husband, Pietro, that he doesn't really come to tournaments too often, so your readers might not know him. We're, we're all best of friends in, in real life. Uh, so uh, if we didn't have coronavirus, um, we'd all be having dinner together at least once a week. And so we're very happy to find ways to socialize over the internet, given the lockdown situation. So Barbu World Championships would be a good opportunity. Is Pietro on the team? Pietro uh, is not a uh, Barbu player, only when, only when forced. He's, uh, he's one of these guys, he teaches and directs Bridge for a living, and that's pretty much enough cards for Pietro. Uh, he, he likes to, he's a real student of history and player of um, some of the intricate online video games. So he has his own active interests, whereas the, the other three of us, I think, could pretty much play cards from dusk till dawn and, and be happy. Who is the other member of the of your team, the Barbu team? Yeah, so we've got a six-handed team. All folks that have played some um, bridge in their time, John and Mike Rice, who are, I think, probably around my age, perhaps, and uh, but uh, retired from bridge. Um, they are you know have real jobs and other lives and so forth. And uh, we we adopted uh, a Belgium. Belgian because there are no uh, there's not enough Belgians for a, a national team. Steven de Donder, who's actually a um, strong bridge player, who's represented uh, Belgium in the World Championships uh, a number of times. We basically have a, an all bridge team, team bridge. And he's a strong Barbu player too, Steven. Steven de Donder is arguably the best Barbu player in the world. <laughs> I'm a li- like, okay, this is my standard question. I'm a little reluctant to ask it. I'm going to ask you anyway. Who's be- Are you better than Kalita? <laughs> you ask everybody if they're better than Kalita? I started asking it, yeah. <laughs> That's a funny question. Um, you know, I don't really actually, I don't know um, Jacek's game that well. Um, he certainly seems to be an excellent player, so I don't think I'd be able to give you, you know, a good informed opinion. But they did, you know, win a huge number of Risingers in a row, and then also beat us pretty recently in the Spin Gold quarterfinal where, you know, he played very well. And so well, I guess what I would actually like to say, um, since, since I can't answer your question with a definitive yes or no, is that he, you, you've mentioned somebody who uh, plays the game the right way. And so, you know, t- that's actually the most important question that we can ask ourselves, um, not you know, how good is so-and-so, but do they play the game in, in the proper spirit, um, mm. you know, sportsmanship and um, fairness as opposed to kind of, I don't want to say rules-oriented because people should be rules-oriented, but very, you know, technical as opposed to being equitable, right? U- ultimately, uh, this is a game. We want to uh, have it be um, fair and fun. That he plays the game in that, in that spirit. So that's the, 
the most important thing for me. Well, I think that's a, I think that's a great note to end on. All righty. Well, it was interesting talking to you, although maybe disturbing how much of my uh, my past you dredged up. I feel like I was, you know, on the psychiatrist couch, um, you know, more than in a podcast. But um, it was it was it was good. It was fun. <laughs> well, I will take that note. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thank you for listening. I really want to ask our listeners to share this episode with someone. If you if you have if you know of a parent who's looking for something that's going to put a twinkle in their child's eye, and you think it might be Bridge, you think it could be Bridge. Will you please share this episode with that parent? I got a Facebook message from a listener this week and it's, it just, it really makes my day to hear that, that you like the show. And I love it when you reach out to me and I'm going to ask you to just go that extra step and to share this conversation with someone who, you know, who think might, uh, might have a bridge player in their midst. And if they do, We've got a great resource. Our intern, Michael Zhu, has started, along with three other junior players, Michael is 17, he started the Youth Bridge Association, and we'll have a link to that in the show notes. Thanks for listening and doing your part. Bye.